Matthew chapter 3. I know your bulletin said 4 through 12, but we're going to shorten it to 4 through 6. I know we're going slow, but um, that's okay. We're really exhausting some of the uh, points that I'd like to make. And this morning we're going to exhaust basically uh, verse 4, and then the next verses kind of fall along because of verse 4 in the character of of John. Someone said, actually it was me that said this, (laughs) a godly man is always willing to give the praise to others. And that was John the Baptist, I really believe. He was a godly man. And he wouldn't receive any glory. He gave the glory to God and what God was doing in his life. The opposite would be, as someone else said, modesty is one of my more outstanding qualities. A little different, right? So the thing today is inward modesty, which is different from outward modesty. Uh, We're not going to focus on outward modesty. And usually when you hear modesty, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is how we dress, right? And how women dress, you know, whether their skirts are too short or maybe they're too long or the neckline and, you know, all of those things. We're not going to focus on that too much. Uh, You don't hear a lot about men, though, but I think uh, there are some men that are pretty vain with their dress, uh, I love this church because we can come dress uh, our one of our greeters, Mario. He loves wearing suits. He just he wants to go to church wearing a suit. So he comes to church every Sunday wearing a suit. And that's good. That's fine, you know. People like wearing suits. They like getting dressed up and so forth. We've had ladies that uh, were late to church, and they lived down the block and, because they couldn't pick out which outfit to wear to come to church. You know, so uh, we deal with all of those things. And that's usually what first comes to mind, but we're not going to focus on that. I think uh, what is important uh, more than the outward modesty is the inward modesty, our heart. It is our heart and where our heart is, whether we're dressed or whether we're not as nicely dressed. Now, I like dressing. Uh, I've calmed it down. I used to wear suits. I used, then kind of took the coat off and wore ties, and now I'm at this point. And sometimes I sometimes I get my suit back on, sometimes I don't. Uh, I have a daughter-in-law that works for Macy's, and I love cl- certain clothes, and so I'll ask her to, to pick me up some shoes or, or some shirts. Like this is one of her shirts that she just got me, so bless her. You know, I, I love that. So I would probably say, yeah, you don't find too many men that are vain, but I'm probably right there i have to wear nikes i have to wear nikes you know i can't wear puma sorry puma wears (laughs) i've got to wear nikes you know i have to wear certain things i don't wear rolexes i can't afford that but beyond that it's the inward modesty that we really need to to look at and i and i really believe that um, when you are inwardly modest you will also be a servant of god because you have the right heart we really can't complete modesty without that aspect of the inward modesty itself Uh, one definition of modest is having or showing regard for decency of behavior speech and also dress so think about that decency of behavior the way that we behave ourselves we're believers in christ jesus and so there's a certain way that we should act we should act decently when we're out in public we should act decently when we're among one another and also our speech should be done in decency and very careful in what we say or how we say it and the language that we use and so forth has to be done in decency and then of course the dress Uh, so what is inward modesty I actually had to look this up and I asked my wife, so is there a difference between outward and inward? And I looked it up and there really is a difference because she was leaning more towards outward because that is the first thing that we think about. Uh, Inward modesty, we would have to turn to Peter and Peter talks about the apparel of women and he's focusing on the ladies. He says, do not let your adornment be merely outward arranging of the hair, wearing gold or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart. And so we're not going to focus on ladies. We're going to focus on that aspect of modesty, the inward person, the heart. Where's your heart? Because God looks at the heart more than he looks at anything else. He goes on in those scriptures and says, with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of the Lord. Now, I wanted to read that because there are some ladies that are very quiet, they're gentle in spirit, and I just wanted to make sure that you understand that God thinks you're precious because you have that type of spirit. It's a spirit to have as, as a lady, a quiet and gentle spirit. Modesty in the dictionary is defined as freedom from vanity. 
And may I again add that it also gives us freedom to serve God with the right heart. And we know that vanity is this excessive pride in how one may dress, but also in appearance and, and in speech too. Last week we left off at verse 3, so let's go ahead and read verse 3 just to get uh, the context in our bearings here. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah saying, now he's speaking of John the Baptist, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John was a modest preacher. I really believe that. He was one that was not concerned about what he wore. And we'll see that in a minute here. What he was concerned about was preparing the way of the Lord. And so we come to verse 4 through 5. Six, I'm sorry, this morning. And John himself was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem, all Judea and all the regions around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan confessing their sins. So John the Baptist is out in the wilderness of Judea there and he is preaching the message of repentance and confession and be baptized. And his attire is really strange. Really strange. A strange guy. You know, I wonder if, if we had a John the Baptist uh, raised up to be a pastor, how long would he last? If he'd come every Sunday morning wearing camel's hair, you know? Cut off sleeves, you know, and the hair's all over the place. And he smells like a camel too. <laughs> you know, or wearing a leather belt. Not a, not a belt that we would wear, you know, genuine leather with the notches and gold buckle and so forth. But just a, a rope of leather that he could tie around his waist and then honey in one hand and locusts in the other you know just chewing on it as he's preaching the gospel message uh what an attire but i think that his attire reveals uh, his character doesn't it for one his sternness he he was a stern man he knew what he believed he had convictions and he wouldn't change those convictions he knew his call he knew his purpose and, and he was going to fulfill that and no one was going to stop him. Not his attire, not his living quarters, not a wife. Uh, no one would stop him from fulfilling what God had laid in his heart, that burden and that call as prophesied by Isaiah there. So he was a man of sternness. And there's something to be said about men that know what they believe, especially those that believe the word of God you know, and apply it to their lives. But he was also a man of self-denial. Self-denial. <clears throat> he knew how to go without. He may have a, had a temptation for it, but he knew to resist the temptation. He knew he didn't need to give in to that temptation because he focused on what was important to him. And, and so he wasn't uh, consumed with the passions of the world and life and, and various things, but he was consumed with God. He was consuming his calling. And so he understood self-denial of the flesh, of the eyes, and so forth. And also of humility. He was a man of humility. He didn't care what people thought about him. He walked humbly before the Lord, not humbly before men. He thought nothing of himself, nothing of his attire. All he thought about was his call. And he cared, obviously, nothing of luxuries you know, at all. Not like us where we care about the luxuries of life itself. I'd gone to Israel back in 2004, 5, right around there. <clears throat> we were on our way to LAX, and there was this older couple that were with us. And I had maybe two suitcases, one to carry on to the plane, the other one to put on the, on the cargo <clears throat> underneath the, the plane there. Well, this lady had like a carload of suitcases, and everybody was like, how many suitcases is she bringing? You know, just a really sweet, beautiful lady. Just really loved the Lord. And we kept asking, how many suitcases is she got? And we're ready to board the plane. And she took two with her. And I, well, you don't come to take one. Well, let me just take two. I'll put one on my lap. You know, she, she got him to, to let her take two on the, on the plane. But there were still like three or four suitcases that needed to load it up. And, and we told her it's going to cost more. She goes, oh, well, that's okay. It's worth it. Well, what's in the suitcases? How many clothes did you bring? She goes, well, they're not clothes. I brought three suitcases full of shoes. Shoes? <laughs> yeah, shoes. You just never know where you're going to be. You might be in the Sea of Galilee, and you feel like this style you know, fits the Sea of Galilee, or this style fits the Jordan River. And he says, you just never know. And we're just, we were laughing. Her husband was laughing. He's just like, yeah, I know, I know, I know. But you know, she was the sweetest lady. 
She was the sweetest lady, really had a nice heart, very gentle, quiet in spirit, uh, very adventurous. Uh, <clears throat> she was just neat to hang around, and she had a good heart. And so it wasn't a big deal to me that she had three suitcases worth of shoes at all because she had a good heart for the Lord. It's not always what you wear. It's who you worship and how you worship him, right? We all know who to worship, but how do you worship? Do you worship from your heart? Or is it lip service, as Mark 7 says? You know, we can come to God with lip service, and it's easy to do because no one else really knows the heart. But God knows the heart, doesn't he? He knows the heart very clearly. I don't know your heart. You don't know my heart. There have been many a pastors who had fallen, and we thought we knew their hearts. But we didn't know their hearts. Only God knows the heart. And God is clear on this that he looks at the heart of man and not at the outward appearance of man or woman. Let's turn to 1 Samuel chapter 16 and get a picture of this. In the Old Testament, and it's not a law, it's a revelation of God. Chapter 16. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 13 and it's concerning the anointing of David. Samuel was the prophet at the time. Saul was a ruling king, but he'd failed God. God had removed his kingship from him and was looking for someone to give the kingdom to, to rule and reign with a heart that was in love with God. And so God had spoken to Samuel. It says in verse 1, And the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Uh, Fill your horn with oil and go. I'm sending you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among you. And Samuel said, how can I go if Saul hears of it? He will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. You shall anoint for me the one I name to you. Uh, One point there is that God calls men to the ministry, no one else. It's God who does the work in a man's life and his heart, and he calls them. We can't appoint or push anyone into ministry, nor do you want to do that, because then it becomes man's work and not God's work. God says, I will send you, I will tell you what to do, and then I will show you who it is that will do it. So go to Jesse, invite him. Uh, So Samuel did what the Lord said, verse 4, and went to Bethlehem, and the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Do you come? Do you come peacefully? Now, I, I found that funny. Samuel's the prophet, right? So, I mean, obviously God has anointed him and he's been sharing God's message throughout the land and everyone knows who Samuel is. He's like the papa, you know, and everyone else, the children and so forth. He's the one you respect. He's the one you honor. You know, he's, he has the right connection to God himself. And so here he comes and there's all the elders of, of the community and they're like trembling, they're trembling. Oh, oh, why is Samuel coming here? Oh, what did we do wrong? You know, we're in big trouble. You know, that attitude. Or, Samuel, did you come peacefully? Are you going to bless us? Are you going to give us peace? And I thought it was funny because sometimes we go to church that way, don't we? We go to church looking for something or not looking for something. We go to church and we're like, okay, God's really going to beat me today. He's just going to let me have it. Bah, 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 bah. You're a bad person. And we don't think about God wanting to bless us and give us peace. How do we come to church? Why do we come to church? We come to church to hear from God. I hope not for a person. We're here to to hear from Jesus himself and ask that Jesus touch our hearts and move us to serve him and love him more than anything else. Uh, Not in fear, but in peace and in rest that we know him and we're connected to him. He loves us beyond a shadow of a doubt. We're sinners and we'll always sin and fall short of the glory of God, but God still loves us and he looks at us with the righteousness of Jesus Christ himself. We shouldn't come to the Lord's house trembling, but expecting to be blessed with peace. Yeah, he'll correct us. He'll chastise us. And that's good because that means he loves you. He loves you very much. And we should accept that because we're sons and daughters of the Lord. And he loves me enough to correct me. 
And so I want to love him back also. But these guys were scared. <laughs> they were trembling. I can just see it now. Their knees hitting each other's uh, knees, you know, just pounding and so forth. And so it said, peacefully, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. So it was when they came that he looked at Eleb and said, Truly the Lord anointed is upon him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at the appearance or at the height of a statue, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Men look at the outward appearance. We can only see what's outside. God sees what's inside. And we try to dress up the outside and flower it up. And sometimes that's needed. You've all heard the quote. I don't think this quote has not been used by any pastor in the world. By J. Vernon McGee, right? Where he said, look, if the barn needs painting, paint the barn. And and that's obvious, um, I think. (laughs) <laughs> of course, when it comes to, to my wife, I, I, she's never really worn makeup or a little bit of blush, and she's gorgeous to me. So, But we do all of that, you know, dressing it up. And we come to church to impress people, you know, to make people think that, hey, I'm holy, and, and I love God, and, and, and all of those things that we do on the outside. When God doesn't look at the outside, He knows what's on the inside. He knows what we're thinking. He knows our motives. He knows our intentions. And you can't hide them from the Lord. I can't hide them from the Lord. I, we stand naked before Him and He knows everything. And we can shrivel up and try to hide or we can say, Lord, I acknowledge it. You know, you know my heart. And my heart is wicked. It's deceptive. I deceive myself at times. Forgive me, Lord. I need you that much more. And so he goes down and he continues on and calling the sons. And then we come down to verse, let's see, 11. And Samuel said to Jesse, are all the young men here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest. Now that interesting word there in the Hebrew, youngest is not necessarily just saying in order, but it's talking about him being the least of of the brother. He's not valued as much as the others. He's kind of there and he's tending the sheep and we just, we don't even think about him sometimes. He's just out of sight, out of mind, you know. So he's the youngest. So you don't want him here, do you? Again, they look at the outside and they see David as a, a ruddy little guy, you know, really no value. The other guys were handsome. They were tall. They were muscular. They could do something with their hands and, and their bodies and so forth. But David, you don't want him. And Saul says, no, that's the guy I want. I want you to bring him here right now. In fact, I will not sit down till he comes here. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, means red, uh, with bright eyes. Makes sense. David had a little anger, you know, and usually redheads have a little little feistiness in them, you know, so forth, bright, bright-eyed and good-looking. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. You can turn back. So, so God makes it very clear that he looks at our hearts, and not at our appearance at all. Let me give you some scriptures that kind of reveal what God is looking for in a man or a woman. We sometimes think we know everything. We know it all. We know how it ought to be done. We know how it ought to be arranged. We know where things should go and how life should be and how people should order and stand and all of those things. And we look at the outward appearance when we're not looking at the heart. And God sees the heart of an individual. And that heart needs to be an individual that spends time with Jesus. I mean spend time with Jesus. Not just talking about Jesus. I'm talking about spending time with Jesus. Having a relationship with Jesus. In Acts chapter 4.13, and you might want to write some of these scriptures down. It says, When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men. Again, we look at the outside. We're in a society today that really pushes education, right? It's all about education, education, education. Go to college, get your degree, and and all of that stuff. Uh, And if you don't have an education, you probably won't make a lot of money. You won't be able to survive. You'll get a menial job at McDonald's. 
And if the wages increase, you might get $15 an hour, like in some states. <laughs> but we look at the outside, and so we want a pastor that has an education. I've been asked that. Well, what seminary have you, have you gone to? Cemetery? I haven't gone no, I'm, no, I haven't been to a cemetery. <laughs> I usually go. I, I, I haven't. Well, what schooling? Did you go to, to uh, Costa Mesa's uh, school there? Uh, well, I've, I had a couple of classes. Well, what did you do? We're always looking for that degree, that education, and so forth. The Bible said that the religious leaders marveled at these uneducated, untrained men, and they realized that they had been with Jesus. And that's usually my, my answer. I've got a degree in being with Jesus. And just spending time with him, reading his word and praying and seeking him and crying to him and feeling uneducated and feeling untrained, uh, you know. But hey, but I love you, Lord. And I'm going to express that the best that I can. You know, and that's it. And so God looks at the heart because these men had a heart for God. They spent three years with God outside of Paul. Now, again, I'm not against education, by the way. Because Paul was an educated man, and he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, so there's something to be said about education also. Uh, many of the Calvary pastors who started off from Kung Fu Studio to, you know, to big churches and then all of a sudden go get their doctorates. You know? Some of them are, what do they call it, uh, kind of a freebie doctorate. You know? <laughs> We're just going to make sure you got a doctorate here because you've just been around for a long time. You know, so I understand that school is important, and one day I want to go back to school. I have to start at kindergarten probably, but <laughs> but I hope to, and, and hopefully again, because the heart is is to get better, to be able to communicate better, be able to share the gospel message better. But they loved Jesus, and that was the important part. Their hearts were right before the Lord. First Corinthians one twenty, <clears throat> Paul said, "Where are the wise?" Where are the scribes? Again, we're looking for wise men. We're looking for scribes. In the, do you know Hebrew? Do you know Greek? Well, I've got books that know Hebrew and Greek, and I can look up the words and find the mood and the tense of them, and then I can you know, give them to you. I mean, we have plenty of material to, to do stuff like that, but call me a scribe. I don't think I'm a scribe. And we're looking for scribes. I remember counseling uh, one couple, and... One of them didn't like the way that I counseled, and so they made sure everybody knew that I was not a good counselor, and that I, had, that I probably am not a good pastor, and so forth. And uh, they ended up going to another church, and <clears throat> they believed her. But of course, time always tells, and it turned out that it wasn't him, it was her. And so um, that just reveals the heart of that person. But we're looking for those wise men, those scribes. And he goes on and says, where is the disputer of this age? You know, we're looking for disputers. Can you dispute the gospel? Can you give me some apologetics? You know, can you evangelize and, and so forth? And that education has not God made the foolish, the wisdom of this world. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. The wisdom of this world is nothing compared to the wisdom of God. We need to be careful that we are not using the wisdom of the world to build the church of God, but that we're using the word of God to build the church. And how do we build the church? By loving the Lord, by fellowshipping, breaking bread. With, it's about relationships. That's how you build the church, not, not by some method we give away this coming Easter a bicycle or motorcycle or a Harley yeah you'll draw people in and free just pick up a ticket you'll get a lot of people come out but you'll have carnal people come out I think it was um, was it Ron Bell or one of those out of Willow Creek his church just blew up but they used all those um, gimmicks what was his name not Ron Bell but his one of his partners um I can't think of his name right now. Back in uh, Willow Creek in Chicago, I think it was, um, he used all those methods and his church just grew. But about 10 years later, he wrote a book and said, how my church grew, but none of them knew Jesus. And so he had a carnal church because they use carnal means to reach people. And we don't want to do that because then you're defeating your whole purpose. You want people that know Jesus and love Jesus. 
Now, in the same chapter, he goes down in verse 26, says, You see your calling, brethren, like John the Baptist is calling, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Then that's right after that, it should, should have said, and those are Calvary Chapel pastors. <laughs> but God chooses the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty, And the abased things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence but of him you are in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption that as it is written he who glories let him glory in the Lord. Yeah, Pick somebody that doesn't know what they're doing so that when it goes right, they can't say, it was me. No, it was the Lord working in you. I love education, but sometimes we can get puffed up and think that it's me doing the work. And God is blessing this ministry because of me, and that's just not the case. It's because of his grace, his grace. And I know that to be the case here. Because I know I don't have the education. I know that I'm untrained. I know that I'm not the smartest. I'm not the greatest articulate person. You know, I know I have a lot of flaws and so forth, but I know I have Jesus. And I trust in him and I continue to to preach his message and teach his word, trusting in him. If anything good comes out of this mouth, it's because of the Lord Jesus. And he gets the glory for it all. Peter said, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God and he'll exalt you in due time. See, a heart that loves Jesus is a heart that's humble, like John the Baptist. We humble ourselves and we let God do the work. We can't push our way through. We can't demand that we have the education, we have the experience, we have what it needs for this ministry to grow. No, you don't have any of that. We've seen that here before and I've seen it in other churches. What we need is the love of Jesus Christ and the heart of Jesus Christ. We need to humble ourselves and say, you know what, I'm just going to fulfill what God has called me to do and I'm gonna do it to the best of my ability. We all have different gifts. You might be a servant. Only certain people can be servants because it's a hard job to be a servant, to go out there and park people and then to usher people and to set everything up. They're here at uh, 5.30 in the morning setting up so that you can enjoy Uh, the whole service experience. So that's a heart for service. And then they're here at the end till 2.30 cleaning up. And it's the same guys. Uh, At the first meeting, uh, my son uh, Roman, who was up here earlier, he said, you know, it doesn't always have to be so-and-so and and -and so-and-so. You can also help them too, you know, with these things. Just because they're here and they do it all the time, don't expect them to be here and do it all the time. Get involved too and serve but that's a gift. And if you have that gift where you just like serving, I love serving, I'm a servant. And I think that's why this ministry is, is a service ministry. Not just a family ministry, but a service ministry also. Love serving, love cleaning, love gardening, love doing all of those things. I love being out there pulling weeds and, and raking and cutting grass. I, I just love doing it because I, I love the way it looks and feels when it's all done and clean. It just gives you this, this great accomplishment feeling. And so I have that attitude too. Not a lot of people do. They don't care. Eh, as long as I don't look out there, who cares what's growing? You know, it's, it's a jungle and there's, you know, all kinds of spiders and lizards and, you know, but I don't go back there. I just leave it alone and let it go. And, and that's not your gift, but maybe you have another gift. Maybe you like writing. Maybe you have design. Maybe, you know, whatever it is, just do it for the glory of the Lord. Just do it humbly. And what happens is God lifts you up. God will exalt you because he'll see that you have that gift and you're doing it with the right heart and you're not pushing your way. You're not coming in saying, I have the wisdom and you need me. No, just I have the wisdom, but hey, I'll wait till the Lord decides to raise me up and he will show us and the Lord will raise you up. And so we need to be humble so that he receives the glory Paul said this also in 1 Corinthians 9, 19. He says, for though I am free from all men, men don't control me. Uh, I don't let men control me. I'm not their, you know, their item. But he says, I have made myself a servant to all. That's the attitude right there. He said, I have made myself a servant to all. I will serve men. Whatever it is that I need to do, I will serve them. Just serve 
And that's the best attitude to have. Just be a servant. I'm here just to serve. Whatever the Lord wants. Whenever he wants. I'm available. And this is why he said that. Because I become all things to all men that I might, by all means, save some. See, Paul's heart was to get the gospel out. To make sure that men see, hey, here's a servant, and he serves with humility. And that's the gospel in action right there. I can believe that. Not someone who stands behind a pulpit just preaching it, but just living it also. So whether you dress humbly or eloquently, whatever it is you do, have the right heart. Have the right heart, give glory to God, and souls will be one to the Lord. That's the purpose. That's the purpose. John didn't care what he wore. He didn't care what was on his shoes or in his feet, on his toes, <laughs> or written on his arms and so forth. That doesn't matter. What matters is the heart. He's a man that was just humble, satisfied with what the Lord provided for him. Honey in one hand and locusts in the other. You know, That was good enough. Locusts were a delicatessen back then. You could eat locusts. They loved locusts. It was kind of like their escargot. And so you go and get locusts. I don't know what locusts taste like. I'd like to try it one of these days. You know, chocolate-covered locusts. They ought to have that at the, at the fair, right? They got everything else chocolate-covered, from Oreo cookies to who knows what. You know, I wonder if they're crunchy and they're gooey when you chew on them. I don't know. The eyeballs pop out, you know, and antennas tickle your tongue. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> you can just use their, their legs for toothpicks afterwards. You know? I'll try them someday. <laughs> there he was eating locusts and he had honey honey's good gives you that strength uh, you see it in the old testament david's sons would uh, and men would eat honey to get strength and so forth and revive themselves and things like that um we used to have a uh, a honey hive in our one of our trees and i wish i would have kept it it was neat. One day we went out there and it was a little little hive and bees were all around and going in and out and so forth. The next thing I know, it grew about this big. We called everybody we knew because we thought, you know, with what's going on in the world today, we can't touch them because endangered species, we might do something against the law. They'll come and arrest me. You know, pastor kills bees, something like that. And so we're really concerned what to do and, and nobody would come and there were people that did it for a living but they would charge you like $500. Of course, then they'd keep it and go make honey and make more money. And I didn't want to do that. Well, I probably should have done something like that or figured something out. But So I ended up destroying them and it was okay. And I wish I didn't because when I destroyed them and I broke off some of the a hive oh boy the honey was so good and the bees weren't you know dangerous we thought they were dangerous so we didn't let anyone go in our backyard but i got right up to the hive and i was able to get in there and the bees just kind of fly around you they were just making honey for the queen so um honey is good he ate honey he was satisfied with with that honey and locust so there he stood uh, John the Baptist wearing camel's hair, leather bowed around his waist, locusts in one hand, honey in another. And verse 5 says, Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the regions around the Jordan went out to see him. I don't think it was because of his attire. I think it was because of his heart. I think the anointing of the Lord was upon him and they could see it. And that's what drew them there. How can you say that? You don't know. Because the next statement in verse 6, we see they were baptized. So they were also changed. So this wasn't a, a, a group of Valley Sunday morning service. This was hundreds if not thousands coming to see John the Baptist. Masses who were baptized by him in the Jordan confessing their sins. When I was in Israel, uh, Pastor Chuck actually had donated a lot of money to build a, a building right off the Jordan River. And so they put this little building there that people can come and you can rent a gown and you can actually get baptized in the Jordan River. What a neat thing. Anybody get baptized in the Jordan River? Okay. Well, I don't want to, I'm not going to offend you, but you, I, I don't want you to feel offended because I'm going to say a couple of things here. Uh, and so, you know, they got rails going down in the water, right? And you can stand in the water and your pastor can come out and baptize you in the Jordan River and, and so forth. So it was really a, a neat place to be. I heard recently, though, that it's not the place where John was, so they were wrong. <laughs> it's in, a, a, I think, a, up north more. 
So, but it doesn't matter. This water flows down. <laughs> same water. Well, not same water because that water is gone by now, right? <laughs> so, but it's a neat feeling. Well, there I was and I thought, well, you know, I saw them all getting excited and me, like, eh, you know, I don't, it's not a big deal for me. I, let me serve. I'll take pictures for everyone. So I took everyone's pictures, you know, from all different angles. And so I didn't get baptized in, in the Jordan River. It was more nostalgic, nostalgic, nostalgia for me. You know, I really didn't care about it too much. You see, because I felt like I was literally baptized by the Lord himself. That's why. When I got saved, I got saved in my company car working for Southern California Edison while Dave or Greg Laurie was on the radio. And I got saved, and then I heard Dave Hawking a couple of weeks later, and he started talking about Mark and how you need to be saved and be baptized and immediately get baptized. And so I was so convicted. I started fearing and trembling. I need to be baptized. Never been to a Christian church, uh, never spoke to a pastor in my life, been Catholic all my life. So I thought, what do I do? Lord, I need to get baptized. You need to do something. How do I do this? Well, that time was in San Bernardino. It was raining. So I just got out of my car and said, Lord, baptize me in the name of Jesus. And I got soaked. And so that was my baptism from the Lord. The Lord baptized me himself. So I, I, I don't want to take away from that. It was just so special to me. You know, the San Bernardino being baptized there, then the Jordan, you just can't. San Bernardino, ugh. <laughs> but the Lord's presence there in San Bernardino, that was it. Of course, I understood later on once I grew that I needed to get dunked in the water. And so I had my pastor baptize me in the pool. But that was a special time for me. I'm sure this was a special time for all these people to come and confess their sins to the Lord. All their faults, <clears throat> all their shortcomings. And then know that God forgave them, that they're washed that they're cleansed in Jesus Christ. Because it's about relationship, again. It's about connecting. Because Christ is saying here that, that it's not just mere intellect assent that is enough. It's about connecting with people. It's about union. It's about real change. It's like not sticking a cucumber in the water or the vinegar. It's about sticking it in there and leaving it in there for a while before it gets pickled. You know, it's about real change. Not the superficial on the outside, the Facebook pictures and all of those things that we see on Instagram. I'm learning Instagram now, so I'll start saying Instagram from this point. Maybe in two years I'll say Twitter, 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 Twitter. Okay, once I learn that one, <laughs> I'll say Twitter. You know, but I'm learning Instagram right now. That's hard enough. So I mean, that's not about all that stuff that we put on the outside. It's the inside that matters it's the heart that matters it's the confession that is acknowledged openly and also joyfully right joyfully that god would forgive me of my sins wow that's amazing right there just to think about that that god would remember them no more as far as the the east is from the west remember them no more it wasn't from north to south because eventually if you went north guess what you, you, you would hit south, but it's east and west. You can never hit it again. It's just forever going, forgiving, forgiving, forgiving. That's the Lord. He's forgiving and kind. So there people came to John confessing their sins and were baptized in the Jordan. Let me close. <clears throat> and I say this in, in, in its context of what we've been talking about. Because I think it's important to understand that, yes, sometimes people need to come to us and confront us and correct us and maybe even rebuke us, and we should be willing to receive it. But in the context here of trying to impress on the outside people, don't worry about what people think. It doesn't matter what they think of you. I grew up that way. My dad worked the graveyard shift. I never saw my dad. My mom raised us. And I felt like I was unloved, which was selfishness on my part. <clears throat> but I felt like I was unloved. I felt like I had to please people in order for them to love me. And so when I found Virginia at the age of 13, I'm like, wow, here's someone that can love me. And if I impress her, she loves me even more. And so I grew up that way trying to impress people. You don't have to impress people. Who cares what people think of you? 
I hear that all the time. Well, people say this, people say that. Who cares? You don't have a relationship with them. You have it with Jesus Christ. Stop trying to impress them. Impress God. Just impress Him. And when you impress Him, they'll be impressed. Because you're impressing God. Because your heart is right. You're humble before Him. And they'll see you and they'll go, that's what I want. How can you have peace in your life? Why do you have rest like that? Because I don't care what you think. (laughs) I love Jesus. As long as I please Him. And of course, you know, we know that pleasing Him and loving Him means loving your neighbor. That it's connected, right? Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor like you love yourself. And if you do that, you fulfill the whole law. So you're not going to say, I don't care what you think. <laughs> you know, you're just going to, in your mind, say, that, that's okay. <laughs> you know, I hear your heart. I, I just need to do what God's telling me to do. And be faithful to him. So impress God and don't worry about what others think. Modesty goes beyond the outward appearance. Yeah, it has its place. Don't misunderstand me. I remember going to Costa Mesa to that one class I was telling you about. And um, that's a beach area. And you had a lot of new believers coming in and out. And there are beautiful people out there. And I remember being at one of the class and there was this beautiful lady young girl and she was dressed like she was at the beach you know and I'm like wow but she was a new believer Uh, she wasn't there yet you know it has its place it's its proper place and so being modest is important but also not just on the outward that matters to God but it's the spirit it's the attitude it's the action that's just as important as the outward appearance being holy before God and pure in heart before him so the bible shows modesty isn't just something for people to see in how you dress but also in your spirit and the attitude of your heart towards them people want to know you care people want to genuinely know that you love them and you're willing to sacrifice for them and if you dress to impress or just dressed modestly but not but have this vain attitude in your heart whether you do one or the other doesn't matter because you're arrogant in your heart. Everybody else is wrong. But you're right. I know what I'm saying. I know what I'm doing. That's not a humble heart. God wants a humble heart. Uh, inward modesty. It's a very big factor with God. This moment is, can be a defining moment for you. A decision where you surrender to God completely by accepting his son, Jesus Christ. It takes humility because it's a matter of the heart. To acknowledge that your heart is evil, that it's wicked, to acknowledge that you have strayed from God, and God is calling the church back, believe me. I've mentioned this before. He, he's calling the believers who have not been in church to come back and fellowship and get right. He really is because we are in the last days. He can come back any moment. I've shared this with you recently. We're not waiting for a revival. God can come back right now. I know you might hear this, great revival's coming, then God will come back. You know that, That's not the case. I don't believe it's the case. I don't think we see it scripturally. Anytime God has brought his wrath, his wrath upon the earth, not Satan's, not just natural catastrophes, but God's wrath upon the earth, there's never been a revival before that. Think of Noah. Men's hearts were wicked. The God said, that's it. And he caused the flood to come down. Think of Lot. Sodom and Gomorrah. They were wicked. There was no revival. He had to pull them out. And so that tells me that tells me that, that God can come at any moment. It tells me that God is trying to... Remember the scriptures where it talks about weed out the sheep from the goat, the tares from the, from the wheat? You know, It's time to gather the remnant together. And get ready because the Lord is coming. And so we need to get right with the Lord. The Bible says that if we lie, we've broken his commandment. If we steal, we've broken his commandment. If we covet, we've broken his commandment. If we dishonor God, we've broken his commandment. And we're guilty before a court of law. And God being the judge, we are guilty. No doubts about it. What we need to do is stop and get right with the Lord. 
and start walking in love and having that relationship with God. And you can do that this morning by repenting and turning back to the Lord. And he'll give you that peace again that surpasses all understanding. So let's bow our heads. And I want to give those that are believers, you know the Lord. You've accepted the Lord. And there was a time where you just, oh, he was everything, everything. And and I know that maybe the church has hurt you. A man has hurt you. Life has gotten tough. I mean, I can understand that completely. But it's not about all that. Who cares what they think? What matters is God and our relationship with him. So as your head is bowed, I want you just to raise your hand, those that I'm speaking to, say, I just want to come back to the Lord right now. I want to renew my heart. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Come back to the feet of Jesus and just sit with him. Anybody else? I'm going to pray for you. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord. Let your spirit. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Your spirit move, Lord. Father, you know the hearts. We stand naked before you, Lord. You know what's in us, Lord. Anyone else? You can put your hand down. I see it. All right, I'm going to pray for you right now. Father God in heaven, you've seen the hands go up. They're crying out to you to strengthen them and to restore them, Lord. To give them a right spirit within them, Lord. Would you hear that, Lord? Would you hear those cries? Would you come and fall upon them, Lord, afresh and anew, Lord? Remove the stubbornness. Remove the hardened heart, Lord. And break their hearts to be hearts of flesh and sensitive to your spirit. I pray, Lord, that you would be their everything, Lord. And, Lord, that they can just forgive and forget the past and from this point on look to the future and what you want to do in their lives, Lord, in these last days, Lord. I pray for them, Lord. In your son's name.